Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Christiana Ochoa, and I'm the Dean of the Law School here at the Maurer School of Law. And it is absolutely de delightful to see you all here. And it is delightful to be here for this reason. Um, endowed chairs and professorship professorships help recruit and retain the finest legal scholars and advance the law school's missions of excellence in research and in teaching. Chairs are awarded to faculty with the highest level of academic distinction, internationally renowned excellence, and leadership in their fields of, of expertise. They are also a very special tool we have for recognizing members of our faculty who recognize that teaching at a law school like this one is an incredible privilege. It's an investment, uh, it, sorry, and, and they invest continually building in, 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 better, in building a better law school just as the law school invests in them as academics and as people. And I have the great honor today of getting first to tell you about Karen Lake Buttry and Donald W. Buttry, who were great friends of this law school. I will then introduce to you one of my great friends, Aviva Orenstein. The Lake Buttry Chair and the Lake Buttry, sorry, the Karen Lake Buttry and Donald W. Buttry Chair honors Karen Lake and Donald Buttry, who was a graduate of this law school from 1961. Don practiced law for 50 years, something he considered one of, the, uh, one of his proudest achievements. He loved the law. Immediately after graduation, he served as a law clerk from 1961 until 1963, to William E. Steckler, Chief Justice of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. Don then joined the Indianapolis law firm of McHale, Cook, and Welch from 1963 until 2001, and later joined the law firm of Wooden McLaughlin from 2001 to 2010, serving in an of counsel capacity. He was a member of the American Bar Association and also an active member of the Indiana Bar Association for which he served as president of the Indianapolis Bar Association. Don passed away in April of 2021. Don's death was preceded by that of his first wife, Karen Lake Buttry, who was also actively involved in phil philanthropic and nonprofit organizations. She had, she had established a trust that matured upon her former husband's death and Don too had created a trust. These two gifts have been combined to create the Karen Lake and Donald Buttry Endowed Chair and has shown us that one of the great acts from which we can derive the most meaning is to plant trees under whose shade we know that we will not get to sit. Professor Orenstein is a person who gives. And it is wonderful for me to have the opportunity to give this introduction of Aviva Orenstein. The inaugural Karen Lake Buttry and Donald w. w. Buttry Chair has been awarded to my dear friend and invaluable colleague, Professor Aviva Orenstein. Professor Orenstein, her scholarly interests concern the intersection of evidence law and culture, and she is currently writing about jurors' emotions and how the emotion of regret can justify rules excluding character evidence. She is also currently writing about the jurisprudence of Antonin Scalia as it as it, um, as it uh, relates to children, and it is a provocative and really engaging article. She teaches in the areas of civil procedure and occasionally family law, legal profession, and children in the law. She has taught American evidence law in China. She is also, when she is not a, a teacher, she is also a great student. Indeed, she has been a devoted student of the Bible, Talmud, and Jewish law as a visiting student in the Hebrew College Rabbinical School in Newton, Massachusetts. Her Aramaic keeps getting, keeps improving, and her application for the, her appreciation for the cultural aspects of legal interpretation has deepened as a result. In 2001 to 2001, to, from 2000 to 2001, Aviva directed the Child Advocacy Clinic, supervising law students who serve as guardians ad litem for children in contested custody cases. She has served as a court appointment appointed special advocate for abused and neglected children, and currently performs pro bono work in the local juvenile court. In 2004 to 2005, she was a fellow at the Pointer Center for the Study of Ethics in American Institutions, where she has participated in a seminar on the ethics and politics of childhood. Aviva founded and supervises an outreach for legal literacy program that, um, that allows fifth graders in the local schools to come to the law school and try their hand at litigation. <laughs> she was named Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in 2017, and she served as Interim Director of the Career Services Office from 2017 to 2018. Before she was then named Associate Dean for Students and Academic Affairs, 
in which she served from May 2018 through April 2021. To every community, community that she is a part of, she gives. So it is no surprise uh, to say also that that is true in her life outside of the law school. She has written and produced a number of plays on legal and ethical questions used for, for the professional development of law students and the local bar. She was a humor columnist for the Bloomington Herald Times and still runs into folks who have put laminated copies of her essays on their refrigerator. Aviva, the only reason we don't have your legal academic articles on our refrigerators is because the magnets are not strong enough. <laughs> Even harder to post on a refrigerator is novelist Aviva Orenstein's 2016 debut novel, Fat Chance. I know personally that she delighted in writing it and, and all of her readers surely delighted in reading it. Thank you for writing that great book. Um, finally, yes, 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 correct. That is not all. Aviva is also a fabulous mother. She has three grown sons and she is perhaps the proudest grandparent I know. We can't wait to hear your lecture um, and we cannot wait to inaugurate you as the first holder of the Buttery Chair. Uh, thanks, Dean Ochoa, for that incredibly generous introduction. I feel the awesome responsibility of receiving the Buttery Chair, and my heart is really full of gratitude to the IU Maurer School of Law and to the Buttery family. Uh, welcome to Anne Higher Buttery and to Lynn and, and Dan Don uh, Buttery's law partners. To quote a rabbi, I, I know. Before I begin my remarks, I'd like to say a few words. I would like to thank my family, especially my mother and sister who heard versions of this talk multiple times, my brother, my children, my uncle Solomon, my partner, Dan, all of whom are watching on YouTube. Second, to the Buttry family, thank you for creating a living legacy. Thanks especially to Anne for talking to me about Don, I learned a lot about what he was as a person, incredibly generous, incredibly efficient, and a fabulous professional. Given Don's devotion to his church, I was inspired to talk about law and religion and a subject that interested us both. I want to thank all my friends in Bloomington who are in attendance today um, and are watching on YouTube. Uh, my friend Ruthie likes to say that Friends are God's apology for family. In my case, no apology necessary, but the sweetness of your friendship enhances my life tremendously. Finally, to my amazing colleagues, many of whom I also count as dear, dear friends. We have created the best of communities, intellectually rigorous, mutually supportive, committed to understanding and improving the law and to creating a new generation of leaders. I love coming to work every day and maybe especially today. Okay, here is an outline of my talk. I will focus on the intersection of evidence law and religion from two angles. After analyzing how evidence law incorporates and treats religion, I will then explore how evidence law and the process of proving things in court resembles a religion. Modernity poses challenges to both organized religion and evidence law. Employing a central focus on justice, I will offer a guiding principle for how evidence should, be, should evolve to meet those challenges. My talk will conclude with two recommendations. One for ditching Rule 609, despite its entrenchment and longevity, and the other for retaining the dying declaration exception to the hearsay rules, even though it's pretty unpopular among evidence scholars and psychologists. Now by evidence law, I mean the process of proof. What evidence is admitted into the courtroom, which really tells us who is trusted and what type of evidence becomes persuasive. Evidence rules are necessarily influenced by history, 
tradition, culture, and bias. They're not just logical rules. In considering the intersection of evidence and law, the first and most obvious connection um, is the approach that evidence law takes to religion. How does evidence law rely on religion? How does it distance itself from it? Evidence law perpetuates and even creates cultural understandings of religion. An inquiry into how religion is understood by evidence really eluc elucidates both realms. I will provide some examples of how evidence rules governing court procedure intersect with religion. First is the oath, um, uh, which, the, which has biblical origins. The ninth commandment doesn't say don't lie. It says don't bear false witness. Similarly, I would look at Psalm 24, you're not supposed to swear deceitfully. And uh, Psalm 24 is also the proof text for the clean hands doctrine in equity law. Now, here's a picture of Elena Kagan being sworn in. I chose her in particular because historically, and even you know, back to the colonies, only white Christian men who swore an oath to Jesus Christ could qualify as uh, witnesses. So women, people of color, Jews, Hindus, and others were designated as incompetent and hence excluded from the evidentiary process. Now, second is rule 610, which is sort of a tonic to that history, which provides that you can't either credit or discredit somebody's testimony based on their religiosity. And this, these, this rule was initiated around 1850 in the common law. Um, there are a bunch of really fun 610 cases, either about Satanists or um, people who wanna testify in their clerical collars, but that's for another lecture. Finally, there are interesting questions about jury selection and jury deliberation. Both jury selection and jury de deliberation can be objected to if they're infected with racial bias, that we know. But there, this, the trend in the scholarship is to think that they would also be objectionable if there was religious bias. So in these four main ways, oaths, rule 610, jury selection, and jury deliberation, the rules of evidence specifically address religion. And interesting as these questions are, I wanna turn our attention to more subtle and less explored connections between evidence and religion. So I will switch to the religion of evidence part of my talk on how the rules of evidence themselves resemble and operate as a religion. My focus here is gonna be on the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, because that's where I have um, the appropriate knowledge and I'm qualified to talk. Uh, in addition, it's especially appropriate to rely on the so-called Judeo-Christian tradition, given that Anglo-American common law draws so heavily from biblical and canon law. Uh, it's not a stretch to think about the laws of evidence as a form of religion. Courtrooms are somewhat consciously structured to imitate houses of worship visually, the courtroom and the church are designed to inspire awe, establish authority, and confer power. The clergy person and the judge, dressed in robes, inspire solemnity and exude authority. They conduct events from a raised platform. Um, the pews or the benches are in the back. The jury or the choir is on the side. Priest and judge may influence a person's faith well-being, and even one's very life. Both a house of worship and a, court, and a courtroom often use an intermediary. In the, in the case of religion, the clergy. In the case of the courtroom, a licensed attorney. It got me to thinking of what is the religious equivalent of growing pro se? Personal penance, a hermit's retreat, solo meditation. Overwhelmingly, however, religion expression, religious expression, like courtroom procedure, is a performative group activity meant to inspire and instruct, 
conducted by designated leaders with powerful authority. Evidence rules like religion use ritual, a category defined by anthropologists as repetitive protocols of behavior infused with meaning. Obviously, the public oath for witnesses, which even to this day is often sworn on a Bible in God's name, fits into this category of public performative ritual. Additionally, the courtroom is replete with repetitive incantations and choreographed ceremonies. Think of the bailiff who says, all rise when the judge enters, or consider the protocols for introducing and objecting to evidence. And here I'll show you a very brief clip from a fantastic movie, Paul Newman's The Verdict. Yes, the document is described. Objection. Over This contrapuntal presentation of objections, responses, court rulings sound a lot like orchestrated repetitive prayer, where the leader calls out, the congregation responds, and then everybody says, Amen. And actually, I don't think there's a big intellectual gap between sustained and Amen. Now, rituals can be daily routinized matters, but they also, anthropologists tell us, are utilized in moments of transition, when humans occupy a liminal space, bridging two worlds or two identities. In religion, we can find this in coming of age ceremonies where somebody starts off as a kid and ends up, today I am a man. Um, a wedding ceremony, both in law and religion, transforms someone's status from being single to being part of a couple. The courtroom space itself is one of liminality. An accused, for instance, sits on the border between freedom and incarceration, innocence and guilt. Both evidence law and religion rely on precedent, tradition, and custom for their authority and sense of authenticity. Mapping in tradition allows us to connect both with the awe and the wonder, and we feel part of a venerable, solemn process. This reliance on centuries of tradition is in some ways very comforting, but can also be constricting. Both religion and evidence law face challenges to their relevance in a modern world. These challenges come from science, skepticism of authority, and a distrust of both religious and legal institutions. As for religion in the United States, attendance at worship services is down. Religious leaders have been caught embezzling or molesting. Perhaps relatedly, there's a national shortage of clergy. Regarding evidence, as Professor Mark Lanter has demonstrated, trials are vanishing, particularly jury trials. So one might be tempted to ask why we need such elaborate courtroom rules, a subject I'll be happy to talk about in the question and answers. Our faith is understandably shaky at points. In evidence law, there are myriad examples of principles and procedures which we rely on heavily, which Deep in our heart, like we don't quite believe are true. Um, practitioners, judges, and scholars need to tolerate a lot of cognitive dissonance. For example, so much of evidence relies on jurors following very complicated jury instructions. Nobody thinks they understand them. As another example, we try and avoid hearsay. Now, from I mean, my students are here. I, here here's a two second version of what hearsay is. Hearsay is when you have an out of court statement and one of the parties wants to bring it into court and ask the finder of fact to believe that the statement is actually true. Or I could use the incantation, an out of court statement used for the truth of the matter asserted. Um, but the whole presumption is we want to avoid hearsay because what we want is the gold standard, eyewitness testimony. However, psychologists tell us that eyewitness testimony is not as great as we pretend it to be, particularly under stressful circumstances. And I'm proud to say that my mother established new law in Indiana, in, no, in New Jersey, um, that uh, requires the judge to give, I hope, a comprehensible instruction about cross-racial identification. Um, but eyewitness testimony may be flawed, and yet we cling to it. This is our unexamined faith. 
And ironically, because our faith is sometimes shaky, we are all the more reluctant to entertain discussions about how law can improve or change on the theory that the whole house of cards might just fall down. Certainly, there's a, a regular unspoken willingness to. See, oh, I have to do this. <laughs> Which is to say, not look too closely at how we operate. The argument for persisting with the imperfect systems of evidence law and religion is that they are our best tools, albeit blunt ones, for seeking a higher purpose. Yet, especially in evidence, there's not full agreement about what that higher purpose is. And there's a longstanding debate about the role of truth seeking in evidence. Now, John Henry Wigmore was a famous treatise writer and an early advocate for codification of evidence. I also have to add that he was a horrible misogynist who um, demanded that, that uh, when, if a woman took the stand to, to claim that she was a rape victim, um, she would have to undergo a psychiatric exam before she'd be allowed to testify. He um, famously declared that cross-examination, a key pillar of courtroom procedure, is beyond any doubt the greatest legal engine ever invented for discovery of truth. I think it's fair to say that today, um, this boisterously and naively confident assessment that trials discover truth by cross-examination or otherwise um, is not fully accepted. We are all somewhat influenced by the postmodern view of truth that it's a social construct mediated through our personal biases, cultural understandings, and imperfect perceptions. So even if the truth is out there, our current fact-finding methods and evidentiary principles are not up to the task of, us, of assessing it. Now, you have to understand why in a lecture like this, I do want to do something like this. What is truth? <laughs> in law, we don't have the luxury of waxing philosophical about the nature of knowability of facts. Real people have time urgent problems and we have to find some way to address those problems with integrity. Religious devotees can and do wait entire lifetimes to try and know the divine. And sometimes it's a little bit satisfying to say that God is unknowable. Scientists not only accept, but revel in the notion that science is constantly developing and self-correcting facts about our universe. But a criminal trial about whether the accused robbed a liquor store cannot entertain such a long time horizon. We strive for accuracy and truth, but we frankly have other goals. So if finding truth is one, promoting confidence, providing party satisfaction, and resolving disputes are others. And I would add parenthetically that these goals could also be ascribed somewhat to religion. But it would be a cynical game indeed if all we cared about was the appearance of justice and fairness or the belief, correct or not, by a party that they got a fair shake. Concerns about efficiency and timely resolutions of disputes, if taken to an extreme, border on the monstrous. And here, uh, I'll quote Justice Antonin Scalia's infamous statement in a death penalty case that it is not unconstitutional to execute somebody you know is innocent as long as they got a fair process. Uh, that, in my assessment, is process run amok. The inquiry into how evidence rules can and should change is analogous to the fraught questions of how religious institutions should evolve. I could speculate about core principles for how religions should change, and I think it has something to do with love. But for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to focus on how evidence law can and must change. Some changes in evidence law are inevitable and undebatable. For instance, no one would say that only white Christian men can be witnesses anymore. But in less obvious cases, we face true conundrums. Overbroad obeisance to tradition will ossify too much bad law. But on the other hand, making changes risks losing the majesty of ritual and the comfort of tradition, whose power may affect the course of a trial in ways that we do not fully comprehend. 
we need a guiding principle for discerning what to preserve and what to and what to discard. Excuse me. My suggested yardstick is this: justice. Deuteronomy sixteen twenty two commands: justice, justice shalt thou pursue. Justice is not something that you're supposed to passively accept or incline towards. Justice is to be chased. The Torah, the Quran, and the New Testament all exalt the value of justice. And justice means more than individualized fairness or equal treatment. It is a term of love that sees a person, a conflict, a condition in full context. Now, being where we are in this moment, I asked chat GPT, this open eye, oh, I, what is justice? The answer I received on the third try, and as you probably know, you generate a different answer every single time, was this. Justice is about creating a society in which everyone has the opportunity to live a meaningful and fulfilling life, free from discrimination, oppression, and other forms of inequality. And in my own words, not that of our future computer overlords, <laughs> I just to achieve justice, we must maximize respect for the experiences of others. Justice cannot be the providence of religion alone while lawyers chatter about efficiency and procedural fairness. Justice must be a central goal of procedural courtroom rules as well. Now, I could show you rule 102 of the Federal Rules of Evidence that does have ascertaining the truth and securing a just determination as one of its purposes. But I have to be honest that a lawyer only cites justice in 102 when they have no other good argument left. Justice is not a standalone principle that's going to achieve a result about an individual piece of evidence. The hope, however, is that justice is baked into the cake of our system, that that is all the more reason to make sure that our cake contains the right, or I would say just ingredients. Now here, I'll just say parenthetically, like who is not nervous when they give a talk like this? They say, I, you know, look at the people in the room. I don't want to waste people's time. The good news is when I give certain quotations, I know that I, I, I've added value. So Abraham Joshua Heschel is going to start a series of, I think, brilliant quotations that so even if you think my talk is bunk, you'll say, but at least I got to hear from Heschel. Uh, I, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel was a rabbi, a theologian, and a philosopher who marched with Martin Luther King and famously preaches, preached that God demands of each of us that we do justice. According to Heschel, I mean, he was just such an amazing guy. He equated racism with idolatry, which would be a whole separate speech, but it's so brilliant. But according to Heschel, the supreme commandment, and one that we cannot outsource to others, is to do justice. In Heschel's words, it cannot be fulfilled vicariously. Dr. King himself fo focused on justice in law. In his analysis of conscientious objection to the uh, unjust laws of Jim Crow, he explained, any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. In thinking about justice, I was moved by the brilliant approach of Robert Cover's Nomos and Narrative. Cover wrote, no set of legal institutions or prescriptions exists apart from the narratives that locate it and give it meaning. For every constitution, there is an epic. For each Decalogue, a scripture. Once understood in the context of the narratives that give it meaning, law becomes not merely a system of rules to be observed, but a world in which we live. According to Cover, justice is not a static concept conceived by judges, priests, academics, or philosopher kings. It is an expression of the stories of lived communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Such narratives serve as a bridge from traditional practices to law that is more just, more representative, and more rooted in people's experience. 
In other words, our very notion of justice must be shaped by the experiences of the communities that are affected by the evidence rules in the justice system. Using this proposed heuristic of screening the evidence rules for justice, I will examine two evidence rules. One, it's rule 609, which admits prior crimes by the accused should be radically amended or eliminated. The other, the dying declaration exception to the hearsay rule should be retained. For both, rules, the narrative of oppressed communities teaches us how the law of evidence can bend towards justice. Federal Rule of Evidence 609, which just coincidentally I taught yesterday to my evidence class, um, involves um, impeaching witnesses with their prior uh, convictions. Now, the general rule is that you are not allowed to talk about people's other bad things when you're try trying them for one specific charge. But uh, there's an exception to that ban on propensity evidence uh, where, you know, just because somebody had three DWIs for the trial for the fourth one, you're not allowed to mention those other three. That's the general rule. But 609 is an exception that allows the prosecutor to let the, uh, to let the accused, let the jury know that the accused has prior convictions that any witness who comes to the witness stand is kind of like, you should know who you're listening to. That person might sound really good, but they're actually a felon. And thereby not, not to make the argument that your three DWIs make it circumstantially likely that you committed the fourth, because that would be impermissible. But that your three w DWIs tell us that we shouldn't trust you when you deny the fourth three w uh, DWIs. Um, now, I want to emphasize get this, that the rule only triggers if a person takes the stand. And I want to focus, it's a rule applies to all witnesses, but I want to focus on the witness as the accused. The theory, as I told you, is that why would you trust this guy who's a felon? You should at least hear that he's got a felony. Well, I am here to tell you that Rule 609 is a ridiculous rule with a long historical pedigree and pernicious effects. And ever since we stopped executing felons, that is to say that every felony was a capital crime, um, we had the question, what do you do with a felon? You raise your right hand to show that you don't have a brand uh, that you're a felon. And it used to be the felons could not take the witness stand at all. But once we say, yeah, they have some pretty good evidence that we hate to lose, then our compromise is to say, yes, we'll let you testify. But the jury gets to hear that you have pride in the judge's discretion. And here, I'm not going to say anything wrong exactly. It's a very complicated rule. And the standard for public lectures is not to say anything wrong exactly. <laughs> um, but when an accused is on the stand, there is the judge has some discretion, not a lot. and. Um, but a lot of evidence comes in if the accused chooses to take the stand about their priors. So my first um, contention is that it's an unnecessary rule. Uh, because, and here I cite the Bart Simpson defense. You can do it. <laughs> Jurors already have a healthy suspicion of an accused who takes the stand and says, I didn't do it. Do we really need to pile on and say, oh, and by the way, we need you to distrust them more because they did some bad things before? It's pretty much not necessary. And additionally, psychologists, when they hear about this, like, Character for truthfulness exception to, uh, to, uh, to the general ban on character evidence are just like astounded. They say, are you kidding me? There's no such thing as a character for truthfulness. There are people who would never lie on their taxes, but would happily cheat on their spouse. There are people who would never cheat on their spouse, who come up with lots of bogus deductions. And so how could you characterize this broad category? Well, it turns out that there may be... Mm, exist some people who will lie about everything, including being the, on the volleyball team of Baruch College. 
But that's rare. Having committed a felony or even specifically a crime involving dishonesty does, is not particularly predictive of whether you're going to lie on this one occasion. And further, the link between having committed a crime in the past and lying on the witness stand is highly dubious. So, so far, I don't think this rule gets us very far. But the real problem is it's deep harm. The jurors hear, they're supposed to presume that the accused is innocent, and they hear about the, the prior convictions. Very hard to presume innocence. Say, I look at you as an innocent person when I now hear that you have lots of priors. So they may want to punish the person, they may just dislike the person, and they may do the improper thinking of, I just heard you have three prior DWIs. And here's a fourth, once a drunk driver, always a drunk driver, which is an impermissible use of that evidence. As bad as that is, there's something particularly shameful about Rule 609 because um, many criminal defendants with convictions choose not to testify at all rather than to testify as to their innocence and be impeached with their prior convictions. You know, we can all figure out why a guilty person might not want to take the stand. But Rule 609 provides insight into why some innocent people don't take the stand. Despite the presumption of innocence and instruction to the jurors not to consider the accused's failure to testify, jurors are deeply skeptical of people who take the Fifth Amendment. Hmm. This one works. <laughs> so we talked about how it's unnecessary uh, and, and, and you see some of the reasons, but I want to go to this thing right now. If you really said, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Fifth Amendment, horrible. Horrible. <laughs> so... If that's the mindset that the jurors are coming with, and the, per the, the person is put in an impossible choice. In fact, one thing that we've learned, tracking people, excuse me, um, who were convicted of crimes and then established as absolutely innocent, exonerated after years in jail, a high percentage of those who had prior convictions did not take the stand to proclaim their innocence. Defense lawyers and their clients often feel torn. They want the accused to testify and to provide context, facts, and a credible assertion of innocence, but are fearful that the jurors will use the evidence of prior convictions for impermissible purposes and unfair reasons. Finally, Rule 609 reinforces systemic racism. Recent reckoning with structural racism in the United States criminal justice system has highlighted the disproportionate policing and prosecution of Black Americans, which inevitably leads to higher conviction rates. Any evidence rule that weaponizes prior convictions reinforces the structural biases that produce those convictions in the first place. So I, I can go through, I don't think it's news to anyone, the disproportional um, burden on, on Black people for be investigated more, stopped more, arrested more, prosecuted more. When they get charges, they get charged more highly for equivalent behavior, are more often uh, convicted, and are punished more severely. Sadly, the inherent racism of our system is self-reinforcing. We jail a disproportionate number of Black men, and then some members of our society, consciously or not, associate Black men with criminality. By associating the accused with prior criminality, Rule 609 has the devastating effect of reinforcing specific negative and harmful stereotypes. Look, all accused wrestle with the excruciating question of whether to take the stand and expose their priors or whether not to take the stand. But because of false negative stereotypes, the effect of those prior convictions will be harsher for Black criminal defendants who choose to testify than similarly situated white criminal defendants. Now, one tonic for unconscious bias against black criminal defendants is to have them take the stand, let the jurors see them as individuals, and perhaps break down some stereotypes. 
But if taking the stand triggers admission of prior convictions, a defendant who is black is put in a no win situation. Take the stand and try to relate to the jury, but have the jurors learn facts of prior crimes that will reinforce negative stereotypes. Or don't take the stand, lose the potential to relate to the jury, and suffer from the suspicions of the jury um, when you don't, when you exercise your Fifth Amendment rights. Any rule like Rule 609 that can credibly be charged as racist violates the basic guiding principle of justice. Listening to the narratives of Black people in America and learning from that community's lived experience, I argue for the abolition of Rule 609. Now, having spoken about a rule that I would eliminate because of justice considerations, let me switch to a rule that I champion because of its ability to do justice. Which of my three waters I'm gonna take, okay. The Dying Declaration not only has a cool name, but a fascinating history. It emits statements by dying people about the cause of their deaths, as long as those making the statements knew that their deaths were imminent and that they had no hope of recovery. Now, the historical justification of the Dying Declaration is intimately tied with religion. The idea was that nobody would go to meet their God with a lie on their lips. Now, the, uh, the um, 1789 English case, King versus Woodcock, is the first recorded application of the dying declaration. And it admitted the dying words of a woman blaming her husband for beating her to death. The court admitted the statement, even though it was unsworn, there was no cross-examination, and the wife was dead and could not testify. The court explained that such statements are made in extremity. When the party is the point of death, when every hope of this world is gone, when every motive to falsehood is silenced and the mind is induced by the most powerful considerations to speak the truth. Fear of eternal torment, heaven's ultimate punishment for false testimony, which I remind you is a violation of the ninth commandment, prompts honesty. Dying declarations have been much more prevalent in the 18th, 19th, and the beginning of the 20th century than they are today. Part of that just has to do with the availability of antibiotics and the fact that, uh, that um, doctors wash their hands. More people died of um, uh, uh, more people died of wounds that today would just not kill us. And when they died, it was of some kind of horrible sep. I've read these cases, horrible sepsis, where they lingered for a long time and were able to make many statements. One intriguing aspect of the dying declaration is that it requires that the declarant had abandoned all hope. Now, whether it's faith in modern medicine, our optimistic outlook, or our denial of death, it seems that requirement is harder to fulfill in modern Western society than it used to be. Uh, the requirement that you know that you're dying and there's no hope of recovery is harder to satisfy where death is largely a stranger relegated to hospitals or old age homes. Nevertheless, the dying declaration is enjoying a bit of a revival. The dying declaration has taken on its increased importance because of the Supreme Court's dramatic rethinking of the confrontation clause. So the Sixth Amendment provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused has, shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Crawford, Crawford holds that in a criminal case, the witness against the accused may only offer a testimonial statement if the witness is either right there in the courtroom or had been cross-examined before. Now, <clears throat> the catch here is, um, and, and the way that Scalia, who was the author of lots of, of these um, confrontation uh, opinions, he tried to rely on originalism which is to say, what did the founders think? And tried to figure it out. The problem is that under his definition, some dying declarations would not be included. The person died, they're certainly not. It, the person died and is making a statement like, it's so-and-so who murdered me. That would be a testimonial statement. The witness is not, not cross-examined and dead, not in court. So you'd say it, you would think it fails the Crawford test. But in dicta, starting in Crawford and every following case, uh, the court has made pretty clear that 
dying declarations may be a sui generis exception because the problem is the founders recognize the dying declaration. So if your whole theory is I'm trying to figure out what the founders thought, you can't come up with a rule that excludes something that you know they admitted. The skepticism of the dying declaration abounds. Most people don't believe in hell anymore. The dying person may be sincere, but their accuracy may suffer as they're dying because of pain, loss, blood, anguish, and people lie. As I have indicated, I'm a fan of dying declarations, and I'm going to offer two reasons. First, I believe that the moments before death carry a moral seriousness that doesn't require religiosity per se. Many people care about their legacies, and famous last words are famous for a reason. This is indicated by the reputed last words of Pancho Villa, the bandit and Mexican revolutionary. It didn't end like this. Tell them I said something. <laughs> a, a speaker, certain of saying goodbye to this world, who believes she has precious little time to do so, occupies a liminal space between this world and whatever follows. Filled with uncertainty and awe that may prompt truthfulness, regardless of religion, belief, or affiliation. Second, there's a group of people for whom the dying declaration provides a unique form of justice. There's always been an interesting subset of cases that involved women naming their intimate partners as their murderers. In fact, returning to Woodcock, let's see what's the magic of my... Mary, can you help me? I don't know why this is not advancing. But um, in, in fact, in returning, I'm sure, and the magic of Marion is that as soon as she gets down here, it'll work. Um, in fact, returning to Woodcock, the first dying declaration case was about a femicide. Now, not all statements made. Thank you. Uh, not, oh, I, I know what you did. Um, not all statements made by victims of intimate violence will qualify as dying declarations. Many won't fit the imminence requirement. You have to know you're about to die. There's, um, there are a lot of really amazing cases where people predict their deaths and write letters. If, you know, if I die, it's, you know, it's my wife who did it. And, and, there, and the case law is full of many such oral statements and letters, which are as wrenching and haunting as you could possibly imagine. But those statements fail the strictures of the dying declaration exception because while they anticipate death, death is not certain or imminent. I can see that the imminence requirement of dying declaration is a mismatch with many women's experiences. Imminence means that the declarant has to know death will arrive soon. Often victims realize that the escalating violence and unpredictable moods of their batterers indicate that they will soon die. The law, however, does not recognize that way of knowing. But when statements made by dying victims of domestic battery do fit the rule, the dying declaration has moral significance and provides some justice and dignity to murder victims of intimate partner, partner violence. I have to take one step back and say that if we're talking about justice, we have to acknowledge the burden that the dying declaration puts on the accused and see whether it's a tolerable diminution of their constitutional right to confrontation. In other words, the screen for justice must both be for the victim and the accused. Now, by adopting a categorical system in which dying declarations are a separate, traditional, and historically anomalous category, Justice Scalia spared himself the bother of thinking about justice of omitting this evidence. But I believe that if I have persuaded you that dying declarations can be trustworthy and meaningful, we at least have to address their potential harm to criminal defendants. As tough as it is to ignore and abuse women's final words, it may be dangerous to allow them in. Beyond the issue of accurate transcription, we must worry about the power of this dying voice. Without a live witness, without an oath, without cross-examination, there are legitimate concerns about fairness to the accused, who must be presumed innocent, but whose denials perhaps may not be heard over the powerful voice from the grave. I believe that the unique 
if slightly odd, limit, uh, limitations of the dying declarations, at least that is applied to domestic violence killing, tip the justice inquiry in favor of admitting the dying declaration. Some of the criticisms of dying declaration exception do not apply to women killed by their partners. The concern that perception and memory may decline is an important one if you don't know the person who attacked you, but you're not gonna get the identity wrong, even if you've lost a little blood, um, um, if your death is caused by a partner. One could raise the concern that the woman is, as the woman as she's dying, she would act out of revenge or bitterness against her partner. We can't exclude that possibility, but this concern seems minimal given what we know of the psychological dynamics of battering relationships. Some abused partners stick with their tormentors and make excuses for them. Some battered women who do not die of their injuries refuse to testify and ask the court to show leniency. The reasons for this are very complicated. Some women know that they are safer if they mollify their abusers than if they try to escape. Others genuinely love their abusers or are reluctant to leave because of children or financial exigency. Whatever the reason, it is unlikely that a woman with a track record of managing violence in her relationship would just at the moment of death seek unfair payback. In fact, the case law reveals the opposite. Occasions where women killed by their intimate partners actually use their last words to attempt to exonerate the clearly guilty accused, often so that their children will have someone to care for them. Much more likely than a vengeance hypothesis is the notion that abused women will finally reveal the truth about who's hurting them because they have, I'm sorry, they have nothing left to lose. What animates the victim to finally report her abuse with her dying breath, knowing, as the exception requires, that she had no hope of living, is that she has nothing left to fear from her violent partner. Or as Woodcock explained, every motive to falsehood is silenced, and the mind is induced by the most powerful considerations to speak truth. The sense of futility and defeat that is another classical explanation for dying declarations trustworthiness, that the declarant has no stake left among the living, makes more sense in the context of someone who has lost a long battle to appease or defend against her abuser. The nearness of death induces moral clarity. The dying victim sees the wrongful nature of the relationship and the futility of having tried to live with and outwit the danger. She is prompted to speak the truth and perhaps provide some warning to others. In the case of women killed by their intimate partners, the dying declaration presents a reasonable balance between the rights of the accused and the needs of society and the dignity given to the final words of the victim. Reliance on the dying declaration exception to honor the voices of women murdered by their partners is not a perfect solution to the challenge of hearing the voices of battered women, but it's a start. To summarize, a phrase that everybody really enjoys in a long lecture. <laughs> I have observed that in many ways, uh, such as reliance on tradition, authority, and ritual, evidence law operates like a religion. Evidence law, like religion, requires faith. And evidence law, like religion, risks making changes that undermine authenticity and subvert the constellation of rituals that have reliably supported the faithful. And searching for a guiding principle of how to modify the evidence rules without losing faith or abandoning tradition, I've suggested that we focus on justice. Justice is a concept that is too often ignored or sometimes even ridiculed in our law classes as we talk about efficiency, utility, and process. To achieve justice, we must be attuned to the narrative of various communities. Most importantly, communities that have been traditionally silenced, people of color, people accused of crimes, partners who suffer domestic violence. All these people have compelling stories to tell if we would only listen. Evidence must acknowledge these stories, be informed by them, and give them expression and respect in the courtroom. Although we may have many important debates about what is just, as a starting premise, the rules themselves must be crafted and reimagined through the lens of justice. The road to justice is not easy or obvious, 
but it starts with noticing. With an attentive ear to communal narratives, evidence law can display integrity and empathy, getting us closer to providing a just set of rules for resolving disputes and punishing wrongdoers. My talk is concluded. Um, do me a favor. In the words of Pancho Bea, if anyone asks, tell them I said something. <laughs> After the question and answer, if you have a question, the mic is right there. And we would ask that you use it because we're, we're on, um, online as well. And then maybe let's set a deadline because I feel people sure. have been super patient. What do you patient. feel up to? Ten minutes? Uh, I feel up to forever, but maybe what we can do is <laughs> and maybe let's do like five minutes and then please bombard me with questions as we have delicious snacks. Right. So I'll be back after the question and answer. If I mentioned the delicious snacks, it was not meant to deter you from asking questions. <laughs> Bill Henderson. So, Viva, that was brilliant. I really enjoyed it and got so much uh, out of it. Uh, and just, and I think the uh, the. Uh, you were very persuasive case of the similarities between religion and the in the in the courtroom, and it was really uh, compelling. And uh, uh, following popular culture, kind of the, the the ways of our society, we see that religiosity is uh, is on the decline. And, and and if we're following that kind of metaphor, we think about justice or our legal system on the uh, decline. So I want you to talk about uh, that regarding the, our, our ability to have faith in in our legal system. Uh, at the if it's if it's a parallelism with the, with religion, and also uh, you know just to make it a little bit more uh, concrete, uh, a lot of us have been following what's been going on with uh, the travesty of uh, of, uh, of January sixth, and a lot of people say, well, you know, when is it when when, when is the, the wheels of justice? is going to be kicking in. And I think one of the reasons is that the prosecutors are wary of, of the ability to put on evidence and the unlimited amount of legal resources it would put behind you know, the defense to make it this contestable. So maybe that gives you something to work with. A lot to work with. Um, uh, let me say that I do think we are in a moment in time where we are less confident in, in all our institutions. And um, particularly, I would add the Supreme Court. That, that, that's the first time you hear people talking about um, you know, people in the street going, what? How's this happening? I thought it was, you know, and naively people think of just, you know, justice as neutral, which is impossible. Uh, but, but that, but there's a, there's a continuum and, you know, hyper-political is not great either. So, um, I think you're absolutely right in, in, and this is a whole different lecture about justice and the cost of justice, that one problem with our, our evidence rules is that they really require expertise. And with given, especially in civil cases, the ability to just drown somebody in paperwork, um, indicate that it's very hard to, we don't get the system that the average person thinks, the justice system is for me. The justice system is where I pay my parking tickets, the justice system is where I get divorced, and the justice system is where I get in trouble. But not where I find, you know, and here I really support some of the work of our, our colleagues who are, in, you know, worrying about how to make that system more accessible. So I think that, you know, one of the things that heartens me is that people who serve on juries overwhelmingly end up believing more in the system. They're really heartened by it. And so to what extent can we involve people in it? Now, that's, you asked such a broad question, and I gave you such a broad answer. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, think it's, I think it's really profound, and I think we are in a moment of crisis. Um, and it's not that people don't really want to cling to institutions. I, I think we feel bereft when we feel that our religious leaders are letting them down, or when uh, the courtroom, you know, the courtroom is just some place for Fortune 500 companies to fight it out with each other. Okay, anybody, I'm gonna call it 
and thank you all for coming. And I have, um, I have four final tasks. They will all be quick, I promise. So the first is the most mundane, but important to those of you who are online for this purpose. Um, for the, those of you who are viewing this lecture and are wishing to receive CLE credit, the attendance code for the lecture is, I will say it twice, 42247. Again, that is 42247. And you'll find instructions in the chat for submitting that code uh, to the CLE Commission. The second task is much more pleasant, uh, which is to thank the Buttrey family, um, including Donald's second wife. <laughs> so Donald's second wife and widow, Anne Heyer Buttrey, is here with us, as is um, uh, her, as is, uh, Dan uh, and Lynn Brown, who's traveled here with Anne. Dan is also one of our alums, a 1962 alum, and was the lifelong partner, business uh, law partner of, Don, of Donald Buttrey. So thank you all three for being here with us today. We are really delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for your generosity and time. The third is to thank Aviva deeply for that amazing, amazing lecture. If we can all give her one more round of applause for enlightening us. About two thirds of the way through the lecture, I realized really just how amazing it is to get to listen to the lecture of one of our colleagues that has been with us long enough to earn a chair. Uh, it is such an exhibition of the expertise and deep, deeply felt and deeply known knowledge uh, that you acquire over the lifetime of studying your fields of law. And I am just deeply, deeply appreciative for your sharing that with us. And finally, the last and most fun task is to invite you out to the uh, to the um, atrium out there for a reception. And I hope you will all join us. Thanks.